<laughs> That's not cute. Aesthetic is key. We're going to take that out of there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's just, a, I've been staring at it. It's distracting me. Okay, so something, a couple things I wanted to talk about. I've been talking a lot with my students about the use of the cello bow and how to make it easier, how to avoid tension in the bow hand. And we're going to go through some very basic things because the bow hand is very complicated. And I will say, if you want to really work on your bow hand efficiently, you will get custom catered advice by seeing a private teacher. Of course, you're going to get individualized catered advice. So what I'm going to talk about is kind of the basic fundamentals of using the bow and just some general things to kind of get you on the right track for ease of bow use. So let's talk about the bow hand shape really quick. So I have a video of this on YouTube, but I'm going to briefly summarize it right now, kind of my formula for holding the bow. So. As always, if you're working on the mechanics of the bow, I recommend looping your thumb into the tip, your left thumb into the tip, so you don't, you don't drop the bow. You know, it doesn't fall on the floor. So, so what I do is I take my hand and I flip the wrist, so it naturally drapes. Like someone says something ridiculous, you go, Ugh. you know? You know those kind of people I'm talking about. And so your hand is relaxed and the fingers are draped. And already, this is pretty similar to the bow hand shape, kind of this idea of relaxed fingers, floppy fingers. And I'm going to put my middle and ring finger by the thumb. And we think of it as like the fox puppet, the fox puppet. You know what I mean? And your frog is like a little tasty morsel and you're going to open your mouth of your hand shape and you're going to put your thumb on this little black piece you see how there's a little indentation right here i'm showing it to youtube now that's where your thumb's going to go and so you take your your relaxed fox hand you open its mouth the thumb Ooh, too relaxed. The thumb comes in contact with this little knob and my fingers drape down. So I'm on the frog. I'm not beyond the frog. That's a common mistake because you're gonna scrape your strings doing that. So you wanna stay on the frog. And then one and four, relax. And that is the basics of the bow hand shape. Now, of course, this is easy. And then when you start to play, it does a bunch of wacky things. So, something to keep in mind, you want to keep your fingers together like this so they act like a unit. A little bit of spacing is okay, but then I, I see bow hands that look like this. And if our fingers are so spread apart, that already has a lot of tension. Like, my pinky is pretty much locked. Like, all the knuckles are flat. And you, you have so much tension already and you're not even playing. So you want to keep the fingers closer together like a unit. And what I recommend, especially if you feel like you learn the bow hand maybe incorrectly or you have bad habits, you want to take baby steps to reset yourself. You know, if you're working on music and you're thinking, well, if I really focus on it, it's just going to happen. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be really great if things work that way. But going into small pieces, like working on small things, can help it to eventually integrate itself. So once you, so I'm gonna like pretend I'm doing this again, relax, fox, nibble on the frog, and they relax. So. <laughs> I see frog emojis on YouTube and I really appreciate those. And put it on the, the, the string and start with small.
small bows first and see if you start playing and kind of, oh, oh, what is happening? Oh, and like if your bow hand turns into something, something kind of crazy, you reset. So you take the tip again, you go through that exercise and you do it again. So you start with small bows for a couple days. Then two days later, maybe do the quarter of the bow. Um, five days later, do half of the bow, etc. So you're gradually building up your bow length with the correct form in your bow hold, bow hand shape. I like to say hand shape. Um, people also know it as the bow hold, but it's really more of a shape that is malleable and changes. A hold kind of sounds like it's static. I prefer hand shape so it can be more flexible. <laughs> and so you, do, you can do that as an open string warm up and that is something pretty helpful you can do as your warm up and so you have to be careful though it doesn't turn into sad tone like still try to aim for a good sound and just watch your fingers see like does your first finger point out you can look down at your bow fingers without doing this because now we're um this isn't aligned anymore so that's a common thing i also see with students is i gotta watch myself well you can you can look down this way so be careful of that and i know that's easier said than done that's something i need to work on is um i used to be so bad when i was a kid but i i have this tendency to like get into my instrument and sometimes you know, especially if we're going up high, we want to feel a little more weight. So sometimes we get above the instrument a little, but you can still remain tall, not, you don't want to concave into your instrument. So anyways, um, small bows, watching the fingers, and if you have to, you take the tip and you kind of, you do the reset and you start again. So small. And then you do it a little more. And you can do it on other strings. And you can do that as your open string warm up and to work on your bow hand shape. So that is kind of more catered towards beginners or younger intermediate cellists that want to touch base on their bow hold. And again, if you are not content with your tone quality on cello, it all goes back to the bow arm, really. That's kind of the first place you should look is if the bow um, is to kind of evaluate what's going on with your bow arm if you don't like your tone. So if you're playing, there's kind of a three-part formula, I like to think of it. Um, you start up here with the forearm and elbow. Three. Why can I only think of two? <laughs> Wait, this is part one. It'll come to me. I'll start talking and it'll come to me. So part one. Oh, hello. Hello. I see Rob has joined on Instagram. Hi, Rob. So quick, quick plug for Rob. Um, I am going to be on his podcast, Meet Cute. Meet Cute. Um, check out that podcast. It is so wholesome and delightful. And we've been doing a collaboration behind the scenes. It's going to be coming out really soon. His team has been amazing. So Go check out that podcast because you might see a familiar uh, face, hear some familiar stories on that podcast. So go check them out. Meet Cute Podcast. Yeah. They have a website and social. So if you don't like the tone, start with the elbow. So oftentimes beginners can play like this and you're taking your weight out of the instrument. So you want to make sure your elbow is the lowest point of 
your bow arm. So kind of looking like I use a flamingo analogy with my students. Flamingo analogy. And so that also involves the wrist to be slightly perky. So we don't want a flat wrist, but we don't want something that again is going to be tense or pulling. So just a little bend in the wrist. Okay, especially if you bow and you hear a lower string coming in. So I'm on the D string. And if you hear that and you go, why am I on two strings? Think about a perkier wrist. Kind of if your wrist is flat, it's gonna, it can push your frog down. So a little bit of a perkier wrist and already your tone should increase, your volume can increase, your sense of power can increase. So you wanna be weighted. So what I tell students to do is to do a shrug, like a big shrug by their shoulders and then drop it. When you put the bow on the string, we do a shrug and we drop it. And that feeling of letting go of everything, that's how you should feel. So when you do a shrug, you release anything you might have been suspending, and that's how, that's your goal. You want to feel that way on the instrument. So that's huge, the low elbow. The perky wrist, I think we're going to call number two. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, is kind of the perkier wrist. And number three, um, of course, is the, the handshake we've been talking about. So I would say this is one of the most common mistakes is the high elbow. And then, cause everyone gets so focused on the bow hand shape. And that is so important. It's a good thing people worry about it, but at the same time, if your arm isn't right, your hand is gonna feel like it has to compensate. So you kinda, you gotta work your way down, I believe. You know, if, if something higher up in your arm is wrong, or causing tension, then, you know, how can this be correct? How can you feel fluid enough to correct this? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So for you dolls who don't know, I'm living in the desert. I'm in Las Vegas. So it's pretty, it's kind of dry today. It's been getting hot. Oh. So, where are my questions at? Are all of your practice room adventures completely perfect? Nothing's wrong. Everything's brilliant. You guys, you guys play cello perfectly. You don't need me anymore. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hello. Hello. Oh, someone asks, how are you? That is very nice. Thank you. I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. I just, um, for those of you who might not know, I just released a big music video project on my YouTube channel um, that you all should check out if you haven't seen already. It's, it was a really fun project. Um, it's a piece by living composer Philippe Sandy, and it is entitled In Search of Hope. And he wrote this piece kind of in light of what's been going on in the world in the past one to two years. Oh, hello, hi, new people on YouTube. Thank you for your kind words on YouTube. Um, I love giving you dolls tips and tricks. Um, but yes, on my YouTube channel, um, In Search of Hope, um, it was really meaningful to be a part of something that was written to bring comfort during the past year and past couple years between um, the war in Ukraine and the pandemic that is still an active part of our lives. So he wrote this piece to kind of bring comfort um, with all these events going on in the world. So it was a nice project to be a part of. So check that out on YouTube. Now we have a question. Thank you from YouTube. How do you balance practicing etudes and exercises, classical rep, and more pop and modern stuff? Yes, that's a great question. 
Um, especially if you are out of school and freelancing, it is a huge balancing act. And to answer your question, I don't really know yet. I think it's something that has to adjust and move with you as your career moves. But what I can say right now, you know, it is something difficult. It's something I always think about when I'm practicing, what should I do next? And I'll give you some general ideas of what I found helpful so far, although I feel like I'm always searching for a better sense of balance. But essentially, I think about um, what do I have coming up in maybe the next week? So there was a time where I got a last minute gig playing pop and classic rock and the set had to be memorized. So that was 80% of what I practiced that week was pop, rock. Because it, it was, you know, it was a gig that was very important to me and I wanted to do well. And I'm a very, um, I believe it's called kinetic learner by, by doing, like I'm um, doing a physicality part of your learning helps you to remember stuff better. So I'm a very kinetic learner playing something, um, getting it in my fingers is a big part of how I memorize stuff. And so at first I ask, what do I have going on? Do I have a big gig coming up, a concert coming up? If I don't, I try to rotate. So right now, kind of the genres or musical food groups I'm doing is the pop and rock for some ensembles here in Vegas. I have, you know, classical cello music that I love, like Bach, and I try to keep a concerto under my fingers. And then I do some etudes, things like that, exercises. So I always warm up with exercises and etudes. And then, you know, I, I think about what didn't I play yesterday and I try to play that today. So in a way, I don't really go more than two, one to two days without cycling through um, classical music slash modern music slash pop and rock music. So those are kind of the three groups I'm in right now. Um, classical stuff, whether it's for my enjoyment or for a cello doll related project. I do um, modern music, which I'll talk about in a second, modern music, and then pop and rock music. And so I kind of try to rotate them and I think about what didn't I play yesterday? Did I play it two days ago? And if the answer is no, I usually make that my priority. So I basically rotate and through rotation, I think it's good because, um, uh, going through rotations, it makes you feel like everything's fresh. And for me and my anxiety, <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm doing upkeep while still learning. Like I'm not letting anything fall into the background and get lost. And that's just good for me. You know, there are different players who are capable of different things. And you know, I just feel more comfortable myself if I rotate and touch on things frequently. So I hope that answers your question. And one thing I will say in general, and this is a whole can of worms, and I would love to hear if any of you dolls who went to traditional conservatories ever had help in this. There's a huge difference between how to practice when you're in school. Oh my goodness, so many great questions on YouTube. Thank you, I'm gonna get to them super quick. I promise, I promise. Um, yay, but what, what I'm gonna say, you know, I, I wish we were kind of warned or talked to about, you know, when we get out of school, you don't have a jury to play, which is kind of like a playing exam you have every semester, they call it a jury. You don't have juries. 
Um, unless you're a concert musician with like a manager and a set schedule, concerts are sporadic and you need to hold yourself so accountable. But in a way, you can practice whatever you want. You can practice whatever you want. And that's liberating and exciting, but that structure kind of made me go, oh, like, where's my structure? What do I do? And how I practice is different. And I just, I just feel like kind of that overwhelming sense of, oh my gosh, like, how do I practice now? My world is so different. My needs are so different. Um, so it's been something I'm thinking about quite a bit. And the thing is, my, a lot of my cello teachers were so great at teaching me how to practice efficiently that I used those skill sets now. And that's really saved me a lot of trouble. And I'm so grateful for that. Don't get me wrong. Like I've had some great cello mentors, but I've only had a, a few conversations with professionals saying like, you know, you're not going to be able to practice many hours a day. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And I'm realizing they're right. And it's like kind of alarming. So I have had conversations, don't get me wrong, but I wish I had more. So it's, yeah, balancing act. All right, questions. Um, adult learner here, I've been renting a cello. I'm thinking of purchasing my own, but I'm nervous. Of course, it's a huge commitment. I'm worried about making the big purchase. Any tips or helpful notes for testing cellos? That's an excellent question. Congratulations on pursuing your own instrument. That's very exciting. And I will say, I have a two part vlog series on this. And the thing is, I should really share it again because it's old. I think I made it in 2019. So you might not see it in my feed, but I actually have a two part vlog series where I talk about this in depth, but I'm going to give you kind of my general tips. So to this um, adult beginner, I'd be interested to know if you live near a major city like a metropolis. Now I'm not saying you, you are going to have more options in a big city like Boston, New York, Chicago. I'm not saying you have to go there. I've heard of people who have found gems in hidden places, but I know you will have more options. Um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, kind of these big metropolis. Oh my gosh, you're in Boston. Well, I got, okay. All right. I got this. Okay. I bought Shelly in Boston and I'm going to tell you my luthier, Curtis Bryant, Curtis Bryant, all of you write it down. Um, to this YouTube user, I did an interview with Kurt in his shop. Um, it's on my YouTube channel. You can type uh, Curtis Bryant cello interview or just look on my channel. I did it, I think last fall. And he has hidden gems. That's how I found Chelly. Um, and tell him I sent you um, because he's a dear uh, friend and supporter of mine. Um, he does excellent work. And so to kind of put Kurt, um, Curtis Bryant into this analogy, um, he is a freelance luthier, cello maker, and um, instrument salesman. And because he's independent, he doesn't have to work through a third party like string shop name. And that's not a bad thing, but if you go with a freelance luthier, there's no middleman and you can generally get a better deal um, because you know, the string shop, we have to raise enough funds to upkeep the string shop. And you know, it can cause, um, if the string shop is super reputable and an old string shop, they might raise the prices a little bit. So 
I encourage you to look for independent luthiers. I was very lucky in finding Kurt, and he's one of my big secrets if you're on the East Coast and you want a cello. Curtis Bryant of Watertown, um, he's great. He's amazing. Um, Watertown, Massachusetts is right next to Boston, so he's practically in Boston, super close. But that's kind of my first tip is seeing if, and also, you know, if you go to a string shop and you meet with them and you go to try out cellos, really pay attention to how you feel in terms of being treated. Um, because you, you know, if you buy an instrument from them, you're gonna go back, you're gonna get maintenance, if you need a tune up, if you need something changed, you wanna feel like you're being taken care of. Not that you're just a customer. Um, and again, I'm, I'm really not trying to um, uh, say string shops are bad. They can just offer a mixed experience. So I, I just, you know, I don't want people, I've heard a couple horror stories and I just don't want people to have that happen. So just, you know, just be kind of aware and trust your gut feeling. Um, so there's that. And um, if you can bring a musician friend with you while you try out cellos, so they can sit in the room with you and be the audience perspective. And if they're a musician, they have a trained ear and can listen and give you feedback. If you, um, excuse me, if you can't find someone to go to the shop with you, bring your phone. Bring your tablet, record yourself. Now granted, you know, it's not a great uh, professional mic, but you are gonna be able to hear differences. Um, you know, and phone mics are pretty decent nowadays. Um, a lot of my videos on Instagram are just in my phone. <laughs> I just record them on my phone. Like, it's really not too bad. Um, so what you can do is you can record yourself listen back in the shop or if you need a night to sleep on it um uh sleep on it listen to the videos you recorded um and you know you can label them label your videos or write down the order you try out the cello so you can remember which videos which cello and then the other thing i will say is Yay, okay, good. Um, and the final thing I will say is most string shops, they should, they should, this is very common practice, they'll allow you to take an instrument home and kind of try it out for a few days if you um, really are loving an instrument because it's such a big decision. No one should expect you to walk into a shop and buy a cello that day. I mean, it's such a big, it's a big decision, you know? And if you feel pressured to do that, then it's not a good situation. Um, so what I would say is take home the cello a day or two before your next lesson so you can play it with your teacher. And then here's the kicker. You can give the cello to your teacher to play. So you're hearing someone who is super experienced and knowledgeable play the full potential of your instrument. Um, even when I bought Shelly, I was 16 years old. I shouldn't say I bought him because my parents, um, God bless them, they helped me like any 16 year old who needs an instrument. Um, so for you youngins out there, I really hope you have supportive parents. It really makes a difference. Um, but I was 16. I'm 28 and I don't think I'm at my full potential yet, let alone when I was 16. So, you know, when I brought it to my teacher and I got to hear him play it at the time, it was very enlightening to me because I heard the potential of this instrument. So that's my super, super big, um, I said it was gonna be condensed, but it was long. So if you're on the East Coast, Curtis Bryant of Boston is amazing. And tell him, your girl Cello Doll sent you because he's excellent. I recommend a shop to everyone. Even if you need repairs, 
He does repairs. He does restorations. Um, great. Super um, hidden gem in the Boston area. Repairs, sales, restorations, and appraisals. Um, all right. We have another question. Um, hello. Um, can, oh, okay. Great. So someone on in, uh, YouTube wants to know about sonatas and concertos for beginners, kind of your first, um, I'm running out of water. It's very sad. Oh, you're most welcome um, on YouTube, of course. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, so I'm also looking very kind words on Instagram. Thank you all so much for being here. Can you play violin? No. <laughs> no, I cannot play the violin. Um, I put a violin on my leg and I've, or in between my knees or on my leg and I played it just for funsies. But no, I don't play the violin. Um, there are some parallels, but not a whole lot. Not as much as you would think. The violin requires, um, yes, if you tell a cello player to play spiccato and a violin player to play spiccato, it sounds similar, but especially because the violin is on the shoulder and their bow is more vertical versus our bow being horizontal, it's so different. Um, so no, I don't play violin. I'm working enough on celli and composing, so those are my instruments of expertise, if you will. That's enough for me. Um, okay, so beginner sonatas and concertos. All right, you beginners out there, you got your paper and pencil for your beginner um, cello concertos. Hello! Hello! I see an amazing colleague, that cello guy. Hello! We're doing Cello Tip Tuesday! I'm trying to be knowledgeable and help my dolls. So good to see you! So good to see you! Um, oh, I'm flushed. Um, Kermain, look him up. Amazing, amazing uh, cellist, vocalist, um, artist. So many um, amazing skill sets. That cello guy um, is his socials and website. <sighs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that cello guy. If you don't know him, you better know him. My dolls, that's an order. He's amazing. Um, okay, beginner concertos and sonatas. I'm so sorry. I keep getting distracted. Um, okay, so a concerto I'm actually working on, I'm teaching a student right now, is the Golterman Concerto in G major. He wrote a couple, um, but the, the one in G major is pretty good for a um, beginner. And, okay, so the Golterman Cello Concerto this isn't a cello sonata, but a piece for cello and piano that is a standard. Um, as you get more comfortable with shifting, I don't know if you shift yet, but the swan is a good piece for cello and piano. It's shorter, it's slower, but it's a classic. It's one of our most famous. Um, television and movies um, but that's a that's a nice piece for cello and piano um, there is oh you know what I will also do is I will give some recommendations to fourth position only okay that's good to know 
Um, I will write a comment on the YouTube video with some piece recommendations. Um, there are, so what I will tell you, um, this is Juan on YouTube. Look for concertos and sonatas um, from the classical era and Baroque. So I'm gonna look up the exact dates. Oh gosh, I should know this. My degree, I don't know the exact to the year. I know the approximate year. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. So what I will tell you, look for sonatas and concertos before 1800. Before the year 1800. Because that's where you'll find a lot of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll find um, I, I don't know how to say this, but so the cello originally started as a bass instrument, like a very accompanying bass instrument. And it wasn't until the classical era when people started realizing, oh, the cello can be a very virtuosic instrument, very virtuosic. And then the music started getting harder and people started writing more solo repertoire for cello. But people still did so in the 17 and 1800s. Um, so if you can find a piece that's before 1800, the music can be easier. I'm not saying it is because look at Bach. Bach is so beautiful and difficult and complicated and it's one of the oldest um pieces one of the older famous composers <clears throat> especially in the cello repertoire but you know bach was ahead of his time so for him the cello could be virtuosic but again pieces um that are written i'm going to write this in the chat in youtube before the year 1800 if you can find stuff in that time, that'll be helpful. And also, um, any of you on Instagram interested in Juan, look at the YouTube video. I'm going to write some suggestions um, in the comment section on YouTube. So I'm going to update and write this after the stream. Excuse me. My throat. Oh, oh dear. Someone said, can you play Phantom of the Opera? I would love to play Phantom. Come on, YouTube. There we go. Um, Um, to do that with Phantom of the Opera, maybe like make it classical-esque. That'd be kind of cool. It's hard because I love, I love the powerful. Nah, I'm not going to take that away. Scratch that idea. I'm going to do something epic someday with it because it's so powerful and I, I can't, I love that so much that powerful kind of gruffness. There's a big organ in it. I can't, I can't, oh, I just love it too much. I don't want to revamp that one. I'll revamp others. Um, maybe, maybe that'd be a cool electric cello piece. Phantom of the Opera on electric cello. That would be super cool. And if anyone does it in the next year or so, you took my idea and I won't appreciate it because it's mine. My idea. You can't have it. Um, yeah, my idea. Someone says, you look like my favorite celebrity, Ruby Rose. I 
don't know who Ruby Rose is, but thank you? I, I should say thank you if I don't know what they <laughs> look like. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure. Um, I'll look them up later. I'll see if I feel like I look like them or not. I don't know. Um, favorite type of cello string? Ooh. Well, it depends on what you're looking for in your cello string. Um, so what I will say right now, currently I'm using all Pure Ostro Perpetual. Um, oh, hello, we have people from Argentina and Canada. Wow, hello, all around the world, so amazing. Um, I'm, I'm using right now Pure Ostro Perpetual Strings. Um, and I, I really like them. And one thing I like about Pure Ostro is they have so many different types. So bold sound, you know, it's not like you only have one or two ch types to choose from. So, um, you have a variety with pure Ostro strings. For the lower strings, I really enjoy Spiracore as well. I've been kind of going back and forth. And those are by Tomas... Everyone remembers Tomas... But the, the last part, it's hard to pronounce. Um, I gotta see it spelt out. It's like Tomastic. Yeah, Tomastic. I'm probably saying it wrong, but that's how it's spelt. Um, sorry. They're also known as a spiracore. Um, and those are great for the lower strings. And if you want a middle of the road string that's good quality and a good price, I, I used Yarger cello strings all throughout college and then spiracore on the bottom. Um, Spiracore on the bottom, Yarger strings on top. So, um, those are great quality for your dollar. They're kind of middle of the road. Um, but you know, I know a couple professionals who use them. So I mean, I, th I would say if you want to try strings on a budget, Yarger is really good. And um, what tends to give a more warmer tone? That's a great question. I hate to say it, a lot of it's gonna depend on your instrument, how your instrument reacts to the string. But what I will say, if you want something more mellow, warmer, excuse me, if you want something warmer, a lot of the strings that have multiple types are graded. And they're either graded strong, medium, sometimes soft, but usually strong, medium, or they'll say like soloist and then nothing or medium. So soloist and strong are gonna be more punchy. So if you want something warmer, I would recommend trying to avoid those. So avoiding soloist, or um, strong grade strings. Try to find stuff that's medium. Um, there was one, uh, hold on. I have a specific one that I got to try by Pure Ostro that is a little warmer. Um, with Yarger, you basically either have solo or non-solo. So you kind of only have two options. Um, but something like Pure Ostro, I tried their Passion. Ones are a little more mellow than the, um, the, oh my God, my brain is failing me. They're a little more mellow than the Perpetual, which is what I'm using. Now, I have to say, I, um, I don't have experience with Larson. That's another big one a lot of people use are Larson strings. And I just never had the chance to try them. And it's hard because strings are expensive. And I know what sounds good on Shelly right now. 
So I kind of, you know, I need to save my money for other things at this time. You know, maybe someday if I get like a, a big tip at a gig or something, maybe I'll buy more cello strings and try them out. Um, but I'm so unfortunately, I don't have much experience with Larson, but I know people who love them. So, um, you know, it's something I want to do eventually, but I hope that helps for uh, cello string recommendations. And again, um, especially if you go to a conservatory, this is gonna sound so silly, but I wish someone did a string swapping party where you could go with your cello friends and try each other's spare strings. Um, so, you know, if you have some friends that are cello, um, swap spare strings. You should have a spare set in your case if you don't. Um, so the next time you change your cello strings, don't throw them away unless they're on the verge of breaking. Um, keep them as your spare set. If you want to throw them away, don't go to string swap, which is ironically um, a business. I know I just talked about string swap party, um, but there's, there's a company out there that I did a vlog for called string swap. They recycle strings and it supports charities, multiple musical oriented charities. So don't throw away your strings, send them to string swap and they'll recycle them. Someone asked, do you like tango? I love tango. I don't have a lot of experience playing tango music and I wish I did because it was spicy. I love tango music. Um, for if you, um, this came from Instagram, if you don't know the composer Astor Piazzolla, you have to know Piazzolla. He wrote um, some of the most famous classical tango infused music, um, Piazzolla. And he actually wrote a tango piece for cello that I've, um, I've learned. But um, he's kind of the, if you're a classical player, this is close to tango for you. But I never went beyond what's like in the um, mainstream repertoire. So I would love to learn some more tango. I would love to accompany dancers. I just think it's so electric and amazing. And as someone who's really clumsy, like horrifically clumsy, <laughs> like all my coordination is in my fingers, not my feet, not at all whatsoever. This is as coordinated as I get is on the instrument. Um, yes, someone on YouTube, um, the Libertango. Yeah, that's a big one. It's a big one. Um, but yeah, I admire dancers so much because it's something I could never do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good one. That's a really, uh, Piazzolla. If you don't know Piazzolla, you should. Um, excellent. So we have time for maybe one more question on Cello Tip Tuesday. Oh, I know the person who said they're focused on fourth position right now, but I just love the swan so much. I love it. It's so beautiful. I just, how can you not? Oh my gosh. I love the swan. It's so beautiful. Um, yeah, we have time. I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. We have time for one more question. One more question. Who wants it? It's free. Any sort of question. Okay, unless I see one, I'll answer it really quickly, but I do have one announcement. Um, that I wanted to talk about. Remember I was mentioning modern music um, earlier in this live stream. I am going to be playing in a really fun, out of the box, wacky cello concert. OK, 
Okay, I see a question. I'll get to it, I promise. Um, it is May 21st in Irvine, California, and it's through the Cello Madness Congress. If any of you know Cello Joe, that's his concert series, uh, the beatboxing cellist Cello Joe. And we are going to be doing a live show in California that is also going to be live streamed. So you can watch it anywhere in the world that you would like. Um, and, you know, we would love to have as many people watching as possible. I'm going to be doing a bunch of modern music and there's going to be beatboxing. There's going to be so many cool things at this concert so um i uh, if you're on instagram you can go to the link in my bio and you'll see a button for tickets and for those of you on youtube i posted a vlog about the cello concert it was a few weeks ago so you should be able to find it it's very recent on my channel um, I'll also share some statuses on it. Um, so someone asked, have you ever heard the Electric Light Orchestra? I've heard of them, but I want to know more. I will say I don't, um, I don't know a lot about them off the top of my head. I just know they were um, a very innovative ensemble for the time. Um, but yeah, thank you for reminding me to look into them. Um, I've heard great things. The things I've heard have been really good. So I'll be sure to look into them. All right, my dolls. Thank you so much for joining me for our monthly live stream. It's uh, really interesting and helpful for me to know what you're interested in learning about. And I really enjoy our chance to come together and hang out. And especially those of you who might not be cello players, it really means a lot that you're here and just hanging out and listening to me talk and, you know, just have some dull community time virtually. So I hope you all have a wonderful week. Um, happy practicing, you know, my little, my little phrase that I always mean from the bottom of my heart, uh, happy practicing. And We'll see you next time. Oh, sure, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. You guys are so sweet. Okay, um, you all are wonderful and your support is always fantastic. All right, so we'll see you next month. Next month, I do these live streams every month to help you all on your cello learning journeys. And I'll see you in May, which is also my birthday month. So maybe, maybe we'll do an extra special live stream. I don't know. Okay. All right. We'll see you dolls live in May. And, you know, I'll be around posting and documenting more musical shenanigans. Bye.